Now boarding, the official boarding area podcast would like to welcome aboard all listeners. This nonstop service includes interviews, reviews, and insights from our talented crew of bloggers. Episode number six is now boarding. Joining Captain Ed Pizza in the cockpit today is Seth Miller from the Wandering Aramean. Make sure those tray tables are stowed, your seats are in the upright position. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Now Boarding Podcast. On board with me this week is Seth Miller of Wander.me, the Wandering Aramean, and PaxX.Arrow. Seth has been on my other podcast, Miles to Go, a bunch of times, but uh, this is his first time stepping on Now Boarding with me. Hey, Seth, how you doing? I'm doing very well, Ed. Thanks. How are you? I'm good, and this one should be um, interesting for me because I'm pretty sure I know most of the answers to our you know, sort of set list, list of questions, um, unlike last week's episode where uh, I just met Dominic of the short final for the first time, and so I really was learning about him on the fly. Um, for folks who are just tuning in, Seth and I have known each other for... Let's uh, not put a number on that. It's a big number. Yeah, <laughs> it's a big number. Um, it, it, at least at least three presidents, let's say. Yeah, ish. I think that's fair. Yeah, okay. Uh, at least three sets of presidential elections. Let's go with that. Uh, I also, I figured I should throw in there, since we're going through the list of things that we've known each other and done with each other, uh, you've also been a guest on our other podcast, uh, Dots, Lines, and Destinations, which is also part of the boarding area family. It is. And I forgot to mention that when we queued up. I've been on Dots, Lines a couple of times, but Dots, Lines, and Destinations uh, is um, one of the primary inspirations for why I started podcasting. I used to love tuning into you guys on a weekly basis and, and hearing about... And now you uh, don't anymore. I don't. Yeah, I just stopped listening. Just don't love it anymore. It's, that hurts, man. You cut me well, it, it was the whole um, it was the whole 200-ish thing. It was... Yeah. Uh, I, I really felt like I was in for something special being invited to be on the 200th episode only to really find out that it was nowhere near that. Hey, you know, counting isn't our strong suit. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad you guys are not in charge of weight and balance. Absolutely not. We're in charge. Well, I mean, do you count drinking down the bar cart? Is that included in those things? Because then we might have to get more responsible. That I think that would lead to less balance, but that's just me. Yeah, fair point. Fair point. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so as we as we get underway here, we've got a lot of ground to cover between the blogs and the podcasts and the the world according to Seth, which is a scary topic uh, in and of itself. Uh, but you know, starting way way back, even before I knew you, and I, I know bits and pieces about this, but tell folks um, how it is that you got your love of travel. Uh, I can blame my father to a decent a bit, and his mother even more than that. And it turns out when I was a wee lad. Uh, probably younger than I care to remember, but like four, five, six, something in that age range. I used to go vacation with my grandmother from time to time. My parents in the summer would send me away. And, you know, she didn't live far from us in Florida. And she lived under the approach path to the Tampa airport, which was cool. We got to see the planes landing, but not like right there. But what was really neat about it is she had a aviation band radio. Oh, really? And yeah. And I, so I actually figured out and now i know obviously i should have just picked one frequency and stuck with it but at the time i would like flip back and forth between frequencies and tune the dial because i assumed that they were always talking and it was quiet for a lot of the uh broadcast time but eventually could actually hear the pilots in the tower talking and that was fascinating to me still is um actually before we started this i was on liveatc.net trying to pull (laughs) copies of of the audio conversations for an Air Canada incident that happened today where their plane went the wrong way and got stuck for five hours on a taxiway. But I'm trying to find that conversation with the controllers so I can hear what they were actually talking about. And it's just, it's a really, that was though sort of my introduction to the insanity that is what happens in the sky. And from there, uh, it grew. My dad traveled a lot for work and I thought it was pretty cool. Um, I got cool toys when he came home for trips. So that was a bonus. And over the years, it, it grew and grew and grew. And now I'm, you know, when I'm home for more than two or three weeks at a time, I start to go stir crazy and my wife threatens to throw me out of the house. So I don't like, I don't want that to happen. So I 
uh, do it of my own volition and get out on my own. Justifiably so. She's uh, she's certainly entitled to that. And uh, you know, I my dad traveled as well, and I remember him bringing stuff home. So I, I can certainly remember that are as early travel memories. And I I think the, the thing that was most amazing to me was you know my dad could go you know leave the house and you know the next night be uh, you know a couple thousand miles away in some other city that I I saw on the map, and it really helped me yeah. understand uh, how easy it was to get around the world. Do you remember the presents specifically? I remember some of them, and and some of them were, um, you know, like they certainly weren't anywhere near as extravagant as what my kids expect nowadays. I, you know, like one that really <laughs> sticks in my head, where he used to bring back these really cool buffalo head swizzle sticks, which I assume he brought from Buffalo, but I wouldn't swear. Interesting. Yeah, I have some vivid memories of a couple of them. Uh, my dad got to go to China very soon after it opened up as a he's a professor and so that was sort of one of the educational missions so after in like the early 80s he went over there and brought back uh pajamas for me oh wow and i i had like the the little footy like the pajamas with the feet built in and whatever and like in florida we didn't need anything nearly that warm there was no use for them at all but they were cool and they fit me and i wore them a lot until they were probably well beyond actually fitting me still so that's one of the few things that, one of the ones i remember very vividly that's cool. That, that's, that's very cool. I love those memories from when, um, from when I was younger. Um, you know, for for folks who who don't know Seth and I personally, Seth and I actually met on a message board called Flyer Talk, uh, and back then blogging wasn't really a thing or at least it wasn't to me i didn't know what uh, what blogging was when i when i first hopped on to the frequent traveler message boards when when did you first start blogging seth uh 10 years four we uh three weeks and six days ago ish ish july 4th 2008 i uh, know 2007 i launched the blog and i quit my job in 2008 so yeah almost 11 years now wow do you, I, you know, I trapped Dominic on this last week, and hopefully I won't trap you on this one. But do you remember what your first post was about? Um, it was an introductory sort of, hi, I'm me. I'm going to start writing about my travels. So um, nothing groundbreaking or incredible. Um, I sort of tried to make an introduction of why the name meant to me. And Wandering Aramean is a bad Old Testament joke gone wrong. Um, so deal with that as you will. But it was, yeah, sort of like, hey, I'm going to start writing about my travels a lot and see what we get from it. it. My blog has sort of transitioned a lot over the past decade, as you would hope things do. Um, I think doing the same thing for 10 years gets pretty boring pretty quickly. But it was early on sort of trip reports. I like to call it the Seth does section. Um, and, and that category <laughs> still exists, but is much less of the content these days. I'm trying to ramp that back up uh, a little bit because I find telling some of those tales interesting. I, I don't, you know, care so much about, and then I got on the plane and they served me warm nuts and then it was champagne time. That's a relatively boring trip report to me, but you know, how do you deal with a 50 minute connection in Atlanta when there's thunderstorms and the airport gets closed three times over three hours uh, is an interesting trip report. I'm working on that one right now. So I'm, I'm trying to work on, and definitely qualifies under the stupid category of a 50 minute connection in Atlanta in the summer afternoons with thunderstorms. Um, I'm working on that, but I grew into writing about some of the deal stuff and promotions. And then that got boring to me. Uh, I started writing actually a lot about in-flight internet service because my real world job is dealing with computer networks. And so I understood how that stuff worked and, you know, a little more beyond just the, I typed in my username and password and then, you know, internet works or doesn't depending on which. Or doesn't. Yeah. I, you know, man, I was going to give you that one, but you didn't have to rub it in. <laughs> hey, it's not you're you're not the one breaking the internet on my plane. I know. Um, but yeah, I don't so think I, you, I don't think I don't think you are. You're I, not, are you? I am not. Uh, okay. Uh, at this point, do you think I tell you the way you said that so threateningly? Things things I wouldn't put past Seth. Uh, but yeah, so you know, I think these days I focus a lot on in-flight entertainment and connectivity systems. I uh, am still the general aviation industry news. I I love understanding not just what's happening today, but looking at big picture, where are we going from here? So it's most of my stuff is very much not introduction to XYZ, but if you feel like you understand the stuff a little bit and want to get, you know, that next level deeper, um, especially on the connectivity stuff where I am neck deep and, you know, still digging, I'd say that's really where I'm at. 
Yeah, and I, I think that's a great segue uh, to, to frame up dots, lies, and destinations in that the way I uh, bill it, I actually had a, a post on my blog uh, last week about my favorite podcast. And I think the, the, the thing I – where I feel dots, lines, and destinations fits in the in the genre of frequent travel is you know for those folks uh, who have gotten a little bit of a taste of, of the world and, and, and enjoy traveling but maybe haven't lifted up the kimono to really understand what it takes to – move a bag through an airport or fix a part on a jet engine or, uh, you know, what it takes for a plane to go through certification. Uh, you know, I think that's one of the things that you, uh, uh, Steph- Stephen and Foz really cover very well um, for folks who are just maybe a notch above entry level all the way up to full geek status. Yeah, we, we, we like to get down in the weeds a little bit. We get lost sometimes in there. Um, so Sorry about that. Uh, for those of you listening to it uh, and wondering why. Sorry, not sorry. Yeah, a little bit. Of, t- terribly not sorry. But for those of you wondering why a 30-minute episode usually takes 45 to 50, uh, that's why. But, I, you know, I, I like those little diversions we take. I like the sort of rambling conversations because we always end up covering something else that we hadn't thought about. And, you know, I feel like it's great to be interested. It's great to sort of get, you know, get the basics. But the why of all this stuff you know, it just that one little extra bit of, you know, understanding a weather delay and like why, you know, someone this just came up recently on Flyer Talk of all places. Uh, there was a line of storms to the west of Chicago and all the flights were delayed. And the person was like, it's clear skies here. And the line of storms was, you know, 50 miles west and moving east and it was about to hit the field. And they were complaining that United offered can't free cancellations and opened up their change policy. And that line of storms drastically changed all of the arrivals and departures out of Chicago and just getting that little bit of, of course, it's clear here. It's clear where I'm going. How could there possibly be weather delays? It doesn't take a whole lot to disrupt how air traffic moves anywhere in the world, but especially the United States. And we see it. And you, you know, it was not that all you got to do is zoom out on the radar, just like one or two clicks. And all of a sudden you're like, Oh, well, that's why there's a delay. That's why these things are happening. And you know, that's, which is not to say we like making excuses for airlines. We, pick on them all the time, but getting a, a feel for how and why just really that extra little bit really is something I enjoy. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. And, and I love the, love the digging into the details. I enjoy the weeds part, but I am a self-avowed uh, aviation geek. Uh, we're going to step aside for just a minute here for a quick break. And we'll be right back to catch up more with Seth on all things aviation. We'll be right back on the now boarding podcast. The Now Boarding Podcast is brought to you in part by Norwegian Air. Norwegian is one of the fastest growing airlines in the world. The low-cost carrier is based in Europe and continues to connect cities that have never been connected before. Their most recent flights include nonstop service from Florida to Rome, Madrid, and Stockholm. They've also launched new service from Montreal to the Caribbean and from the Toronto area to Dublin. With a fleet of brand new 787 and 737 MAX airplanes, they're making the world affordable for thousands of travelers. Welcome back to the Now Boarding Podcast with Seth Miller from uh, Wandering Aramean, PaxX.Aero, and Dots, Lines, and Destinations. Seth, I I know from the time that you and I have spent together that you have a a fair amount of both work and leisure travel. What does the mix look like right now? How much are you on the road for work and how much are you on the road for, I'd say, pleasure? But looking at some of your itineraries, I'm, I'm not sure how pleasurable they could be. So in my defense, I decided not to take the ridiculous Air Belgium, Ryanair, Norwegian trip. So that one, which, you know, would have been stupid, but I'm thinking uh, it could have been fun, but I think is the wrong choice right now. Um, Assuming United will actually sell me a ticket. I know that's one that recently came up that does not look so pleasurable. Uh, You know, I spend about 100 to 120 nights a year away from home. And I would say it's probably 70, 30 split towards work. But for me, work is a confusing thing. Uh, I work in this industry, I work as a journalist writing about this stuff and covering this stuff and recording podcasts about it. So work for me is not like go show up somewhere, sit in an office for four days and then fly back. I, I don't do that a lot. Um, I don't sit in an office at home either. Uh, although I now have an office for the first time in a decade. It's kind of interesting in my new home. So uh, it, it is a split. There are some of the trips that are very much specifically just sort of leisure, um, a vacation with my wife somewhere 
but even those always ends up having some component of the work side of things that falls into it. Uh, I think that's probably good for me because I'm not good at sitting and doing nothing. I'm really bad, in fact, at sitting and doing nothing. Even doing something and sitting, I need to usually do something else while I'm doing it. So <laughs> I would agree with that. I'm, I'm sitting here fidgeting with all of the different toys on my desk and trying to find ones that won't make noise while we're recording because as much as I love sitting and talking to you and I'm in, you know having a great time doing it, I need something else to like fidget with. And yeah, sitting on a beach. I love sitting on a beach. The first 15 minutes are amazing. <laughs> After that, I start to go pretty crazy. Yeah, I, you and I have sat on a beach together exactly once and that was uh, on the inaugural Norwegian flight to Martinique. Yeah. And I think we were there for about 15 minutes. It might have been 30. I think the only reason why it stretched to 30. We went swimming. We got up and went swimming and then came back. But, you know, the, the sit part was about 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. And there was that whole GoPro thing and running out of memory on the yeah. camera and stuff. But anyway, yeah, there, there, it was. But yes, that is the level to which I am able to sit. So One of the things I think that you do well with most of your travel is stitching on uh, you know, some leisure activity to a number of the business trips you do, even if it's just trying on new product or stopping in a city for an extra day uh, along the way. Yeah. And I, I was a big, big fan of the sort of 22 hour layover for a long time. I still am in certain circumstances. Uh, one of the trips I'm looking at right now is, you know, to get home from Europe, do I do a 22 hour stop in Iceland again? Um, and get another day in Reykjavik and sort of hang out there kind of thing. But there are, you know, some interesting ways to do that. And the, the stopover like that on an international trip doesn't really cost extra usually other than the lodging because the fare often is the same. But even, you know, an extra stopover, an open jaw somewhere, a train to connect some cities, something like that. I have gotten pretty aggressive at finding a way to do one or two extra things on any given trip. Um, my, my sort of excuse was, well, I was in the neighborhood, right? So you're like, oh, I'm going to go do this. Well, I was in the neighborhood. I may as well do it anyways, right? My problem is that right now I consider Europe to be in the neighborhood. <laughs> so well, it, kind of, it kind of is. It is, right? I mean, compared to the United States, it's relatively small. The flights are shorter to get from somewhere to somewhere else, unless you're all the way over in Iceland, all the way down in like, Lisbon or super far east in Istanbul or eastern Poland, maybe like most of the flights are maybe an hour or two. You can hop on a low cost carrier and do random point to point service between airports you didn't know existed. Um, right. One, one of the fun games to play there is the Ryanair. Is this a drug or an airport they serve prescription <laughs> drugs or airports they serve game? <laughs> Have you ever done that one? You read a random, you start randomly no. naming Ryanair <laughs> airport names and they, some of them sound like they should just be prescription drugs instead. That's uh, awesome. Yeah. And you alluded to it earlier, but the train network in Europe also makes it wickedly easy to tack on a city. Yeah. And again, it depends on where you are and what you're looking for and you know, whatnot. But I'm my trip I've got going over Labor Day, I'm going to be in England. And one of my options is eh, maybe I'm, my conference is in London the week after uh, Labor Day. Maybe a day, go a day earlier, stay a day late, and hop the train up to Edinburgh, up to Manchester, or whatnot, something like that, and pick a different town and add something else in. Um, I'm trying to do, you know, the hard part for me on that is I can spend a week and a half trying to plan it and optimizing what does it cost, what are my schedules look like, am I going to make my real appointments, and then can I sneak away early, or what it does it have to be to make sure that I also get the fun stuff in. And so your typical, just buy the round trip ticket at $600 and you're done, becomes, you know, a week long planning effort where either at the end of it, I say, screw it and just buy the round trip ticket or often end up spending t enough extra time that whatever money I saved cutting the fare down certainly financially doesn't work, but I enjoy doing it. So I consider that paying for some fun. Yeah. And I think, you know, you were one of the folks that early on uh, led me to, to, to a, a better way to use miles and points. And, and that's, uh, you know, I think most folks think about a trip to Europe like uh, I'm going to fly from my hometown, I'm going to connect somewhere and I'm going to go to Paris. So, you know, for somebody who lives, uh, you know, say in Richmond, you know, I'm going to go from Richmond to Newark. I'm going to go from Newark to Paris, Paris back to Newark and Newark to Richmond. And and I, I think, you know, one of the ways I, I frequently see you travel, which is certainly how our family gets around is, you know, hey, I mean, it's it's about getting over to Europe and back. And, and sometimes that means I'll go into Paris and out of Vienna because that was what made the most sense. 
Yeah. And, you know, alluding to the miles and points side of things, absolutely, especially because when you add that flexibility of maybe it's Vienna, maybe it's Prague, maybe it's Frankfurt, maybe it's Munich, whatever, you have all these extra cities, award space is not unlimited. And when, especially if you have a family and you're looking for three or four seats on a flight, if you can find the seat out of Vienna, then figure out how to make Vienna part of your trip. If the seat's out of Munich, maybe you go to Munich and Salzburg instead. And right. And that's another one. You fly in and out of Munich, but Salzburg is a quick 90 minutes or two hour train ride away, if I remember correctly, and is a great extra little tag on to do and something else to see. So there's a lot of different ways to do that. And especially when it means you can actually get the award space you're looking for. That's a huge win. I agree about definitely maximizing award space is huge and pairing up two different cities to, to make a trip is is the way to go if it's the only way you can use up those miles and points. Before we squeeze in our final break, I know it's early on for you, but how does it feel to have moved out of a fairly large metropolitan market, maybe the largest in New York, and be re- planning trips from secondary airports? It's uh, It's not – Super secondary yet, um, which is to say Boston is still my local airport. I'm not, I'm further away from it physically than I was to any of the airports when I lived in Manhattan, but it has definitely shifted some of my planning thus far. You know, my flexibility means I can still do most of my trips. I don't think I'm gonna have too much trouble, but I'm, I'm going to have trouble eventually. I'm certain of that now. The flip side of that is because I'm not, you know, flying nonstop from New York places. Most of my trips have connections now. Um, I often am finding that some of the fares come down a little bit because, you know, when you add the connection, there's more competition and there's better opportunities. So it's not all bad news. Yeah, that's a good point. I'll be interested to ask you that question in a year and see how things look in the market. Not because I think they'll be worse. I'm just, I really am. I really am curious what it's like to take somebody who for a decade has commuted out of you know biggest or second biggest aviation market in the in the, in, in the world and, and moving to um you know like i said i'll be curious to see what your mix is whether it's 80 percent boston 20 percent other or it's you know 60 percent boston 40 percent other yeah and you know manchester and port new hampshire and portland maine are also nearby airports i have i do have some flexibility there but i think what's going to end up being the deal uh tipping point for me is that access to logan airport down in boston there's a bus locally, there's train service, and I can drive versus the others where it has to be a drive. And I think that's going to be right. Big. So we'll see. But I'm looking I'm looking forward to seeing what it's going to be like in a year or two. I'm, yeah, I'm very interested in it. And with that prophetic answer, we'll step aside for our final break and be right back to Zoom Tooth and Lightning Questions with Seth Miller. We'll be right back on the Now Boarding Podcast. The Now Boarding Podcast is brought to you in part by No Jet Lag. Don't let jet lag get you down. There are flight crews, sports teams, and business executives all around the world that sing the praises of No Jet Lag. No Jet Lag is the leader in jet lag management for the last 25 years. Don't let jet lag spoil your next trip. Visit NoJetLag.com to get yours today. And we're back to wrap up with Seth Miller on the Now Boarding Podcast with a few lightning questions about things that Seth likes and doesn't like. Um, first off, and I know this is going to be hard because your map is very full, but coolest destination you've ever visited? Ah, uh, gosh, coolest destination it is impossible because it, you know my answer, my stock answer to that is to do what? Uh, that said, never had a bad meal in Italy. I really, really loved visiting central Turkey and exploring and hiking there, although I would not go back right now because their government is a debacle. Uh, And I would love to spend more time in Japan exploring beyond just the cities. Yeah, those are three great places. I still have not made it to Turkey. Uh, I had a trip booked for right before the the stuff started happening and, and just haven't felt comfortable going back just yet. Yeah, which sucks because it really is an amazing place and the people are all very nice that I've ever interacted with there, but just... I don't feel comfortable there right now. Yeah, me neither. And I'm sure, and I'm sure I'm overreacting, but I'm okay with that. Yeah, I mean, given all the other places in the world, uh, oh, you know, being a little bit cautious on a place you don't necessarily need to put yourself at risk on, I, I consider that to be a, a a sound strategy, at least you know yeah. for me. So when when the government goes out of its way to sponsor trips to convince people, like travel influencers, to come visit and convince the rest of the world that no, really, it's safe. Look, we'll show you. That seems like a bad sign to me. I. I would agree. <laughs> Since you're as well traveled as you are, I'm going to ask you a question I haven't asked anybody else yet. Um, what's one of the worst places you visited? 
Does getting mugged at the border between Ghana and Togo count? Hey, man, it's your segment. It's whatever you it's wherever you want to go. That sounds pretty bad to me. That was an awful like hour of my life. And I was pretty shooken up about it. Um, I've never actually really written the story down, which is interesting. Um, I've alluded to it in a blog post. It was crazy. Um, and I, this is a lightning round. That story takes way too long to tell, maybe another time. But, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, though, in retrospect, I, you know, I would say based on that, like, Togo was a mess and I would never go back. But the reality is, if I sort of put it in perspective, I was the white guy that I took advantage of. And OK, fine. I got my money back. I wasn't shivved. And I still got to, like, go visit the, the market where they sell all the stuff or the stuffed or dried animals. And I had my meeting with the shaman. And so, you know, all things being equal, it wasn't actually that bad a place. So there are very few places out there that I think aren't worth visiting. Um, I think there's probably none that are, aren't worth visiting. There's very few that I would even put on the do not return list. I certainly prioritize some, but you know, I, I like going places. I like experiencing the other cultures. I like seeing what other people have to offer. So I, I don't have anything blacklisted at this point. Awesome. And I now have on my list of future miles to go podcast segments to try and convince Seth to come on and tell us a story about him getting mugged in Togo. Yes. It was on the border. I'm not technically sure I was in Togo when it happened. Um, no, I was. I had a card across there. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Favorite credit card? Uh, I use the Chase Sapphire Reserve a lot right now. Um, the vast majority of my expenses are travel and dining. So I earn a lot of points that way. Uh, I like their trip, in, their trip insurance as well. The travel delay and trip interruption stuff has served me very nicely over the past couple of years, as has the, I chipped a windshield in Germany in January this year. Uh, rock kicked up on me. Um, and that was a thousand dollar replacement that they covered. Took a little while on that one, but thousand dollars paid. So I've got no complaints about the card. Um, I also like the places those points can go. Um, and I actually, believe it or not, use them as cash for buying new trips more than you'd think. Not just transferring them out to a third party part, to other airlines. Yeah, I would say the people that I advise, I would say that the numbers come up quite a bit for me in the past year to 18 months. Uh, in that probably 30 to 40% of the time, I'm recommending folks buy the trips. And it might be for a different reason than where you are, but a, a big chunk of it is uh, just a lot less saver domestic award availability on United, um, where you know you're sort of shoehorning yourself into less flexibility, um, you know, because of uh, because of those high prices. And so you, if you're buying a ticket, you could pick whatever flight you want. Yeah, and I mean, just we also used one earlier this year to go to Thailand, into Thailand, out from Vietnam. It was an open jaw. I booked my wife a ticket, and I had already had bought my ticket separately. So it's a little bit of a we needed to line up with my schedule, and this is the right way to do it, but. You know, using United Points, our round trip coach to Southeast Asia from North America was something like 85,000 points. And the ticket was cheap enough that I think it was 62,000 just buying it in cash because they're worth a penny and a half each. So I, I have gotten very good value out of that. I'm later this afternoon going to go buy another one doing that same thing. So sweet. All right. So I'm sure that you're going to qualify this next one or you, you could qualify this next one, given what I know about you. But favorite airline? Uh, to fly on JetBlue for domestic, regional, whatnot uh, points, I still think for my travel needs, the Mileage Plus program from United serves me very well. Um, part of that is because I know it the best, but also part of that is their award chart and their partners especially really give me a lot of value internationally. And if you had to pick an airline that you like flying internationally the most, what would you say? Um, anywhere I can fly premium economy cheap would be my answer to that. Um, I, I focus a little less on the airline and a little more on the product at that point. I have flown in the last two years a ton of British Airways Plus, which is what they call their premium economy product. It is not sexy. It is not spectacular. It is not luxurious, but it brings a little bit of comfort back and it is cheap. When I've, let me try, when I've needed it and when I found it and used it, it has been cheap. It is not always cheap. It is not always the, at any stretch. Um, but They've had some decent sales and different things going on over the past two years or so. And I've probably done eight or 10 round trips in the last 24 months with that and been very happy with it. And have you taken Air France's premium economy product? You know, it was like six years ago. I haven't done the revised version yet. Yeah, I'd be curious when you when you do the new version, I'll be curious for you to compare it to, to BA. I have not taken Air France's. I've taken BA's. I have you know mixed feelings about it. I, I don't love the the seat necessarily, but I do love the 
the the price I can get it for or the Avios. Which product were you on? I've been on both the old one and the what I believe is the current one, and I like neither one of them. Just the feature doesn't, for whatever reason, it just doesn't. Yeah, like the seven four seven is not a good product compared to the three eighty, right? And so there's there's things like that to compare. And the new the three eighty and the seventy seven are a newer product. I think the others are going to retrofit at some point. But I'm not I sure. think it was a three eighty because it, they had a. Th- uh, I'm trying to remember if they had the three eighty at Dulles when I was when I when I when I had it last time. I'd have to go back and look. I know I've, I know I've flown it uh, a couple of times. I'll have to go back and look at my notes. Anyway. Um, not to go too far down that rabbit hole. Uh, and I do know your feelings on hotel chains and yet I'm still going to ask what your favorite hotel chain is. Uh, Airbnb. All right. That's a fair answer. Internationally. I use them probably 75% of the time domestically, uh, hotels.com through the proper cash back and whatever channels you get a 15% return. And I know if I wanted, you know, an overwater bungalow, maybe I could do better than that, but I don't, so I don't care. As we discussed earlier, me sitting still doesn't work, and so sitting still over water um, doesn't make it any better. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you how often you used Airbnb overseas. So, and when you say you're using Airbnb seventy five percent of the time, are you using Airbnb as a placeholder for all uh, room sharing uh, services, or do you specifically focus on Airbnb? I specifically just use Airbnb, not because it's the best. It's not. Um, they have some terrible practices and things I hate about them, but at this point, it's easy and it's got the breadth of coverage I need and I can occasionally earn points separately by buying gift cards through a different thing and then redeeming those and yada 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 it adds up to a little bit of a bonus when I do it so um, but I would say I probably do 40 to 50 nights a year in an Airbnb cool and last question although I can't imagine it's a long bucket list given how well traveled you are what's one place that's still on your bucket list for travel uh, I would say right now Patagonia in South America, tip of good, South America. Good answer. Is yeah, definitely. It's it's been high on the list for a while, um, and it's always a matter of you know my, my travel pattern has been a lot over the years. We didn't talk about this earlier, but has been a lot over the years about go wherever it's cheap because there's enough places to go that I'll get to all of them eventually. Yeah, and Patagonia has never been cheap. Um, Easter Island was cheap once, and we bought tickets and then had an illness and didn't get out there. So. I would say that's on the list, but and I think it would be cool to go visit for a couple of days, but not the same as Patagonia. I could think I feel like I could spend a week or two in Patagonia and barely scratch the surface. That's what I've heard from others. And I'm certainly looking forward to getting there myself. Yeah, I will say as close as that is to Antarctica, uh, not really on my list at all. I kind of don't care. I think you're the first, no, second, second person not to list in uh, Antarctica as the place on their bucket list for folks that we've had on the now boarding podcast so far. Yeah. That seems to be the popular okay. one. And I actively just don't care about it. Like, okay, great. I can step on this little chunk of rock to say I've been here, but A, the impact of me going there is horrible, you know, ecologically. And B, so what? I stepped on a rock. Like, give me, there, that's not why I travel. Yeah. I mean, give me something more. I, I, there could be interest for me. I think where, where I get, um, where I get off the path is just the 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 disgustingly long, um, you know, not too calm boat ride to get there. Also a problem. Yeah, I mean, I I I, don't, I wouldn't say I get seasick per se, but from what I've heard, it does does not sound like a pleasant uh, voyage, and I kind of like to enjoy myself on my trips. Yeah, I'm with you. All right, well, we're just about out of time. Uh, before we exit stage right, tell folks where they can find you when you're not on various podcasts with me. Um, Twitter is or Instagram is the same name. It's W A N D R M E, which Wander misspelled. Dot me is also the domain name that I blog under. Um, Pax X P A X E X dot A E R O, which is the wrong spelling of arrow. It's not like the thing you shoot from a bow. Uh, is another good place to find me. And you know the internets. I'm out there. People know where I am. Ask around. You can find me. And hey, you spelled arrow right this time, as opposed to the last time you were on a podcast with me. Did I did I misspell it? You you started to misspell it and then corrected yourself. Yeah, awesome. Don't even know where to find myself. So if someone can find me on the internet and let me know where I am, that'd be most appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> there you have it, folks. Seth Miller, a now boarding segment that I was definitely looking forward to, even though I knew a lot of the answers. Seth, thanks a bunch for being on with us. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And sorry we ran a little long. Nah, there's no such thing as long or short. We'll talk to everybody soon. Stay tuned next week for another episode of the Now Boarding Podcast.